In today's video, we're going to be going through some properties of definite integrals specifically. You, if you remember, in 4.1, we talked a lot about antiderivatives, and we went through some properties of antiderivatives. Those represent my properties of indefinite integrals, because what an indefinite integral, like we just talked about, an indefinite integral is just finding the antiderivative. But what about with definite integrals? If I'm talking about definite integrals, that means I have bounds, right? We might see something like this, right? So if I have a definite integral. Well, my first property is if I'm given some C value in between my bounds, right? A and B are my, A is my lower bound, B is my upper bound, and given some C value that's in between, what I can do is I can split my integral up into two separate integrals, one from A to C, and the other from C to D. And to get my total area, I can just add those two, sorry, not C to D, C to B. I can just add those two together. What does that look like? Well, if I have my function and I'm going from A to B, but there's some C in between, then the area from A to C plus the area from C to B is just the same thing as finding the area altogether. Right? And so that's all this property is saying. So where is this property helpful? Well, this property is very helpful anytime you have a piecewise function. Anytime you have a piecewise function. So consider this example. Okay, let's say I've got the integral from zero to three of this absolute value function. The absolute value of one minus x squared dx. If we remember, an absolute value function really is a piecewise function. The rule changes based off of what my x value is. And in this case, what's gonna be my x value where the rule changes? Um, if I plug in, because if I set this equal to zero, I find that choosing x equal to one or negative one uh, causes my value inside the, the absolute value to equal zero. I'm not going to worry about negative one because remember, what are my bounds? My bounds are from zero to three. So I'm only going to worry about positive one here. Positive one will cause inside the absolute value to equal to zero. On either side of positive one, I'm either going to have a negative value inside of my absolute value, or I'm going to have a positive value. Okay, And it turns out if I have, uh, if x is less than one, or less than or, or equal to one, in this case, if I plug in a value less than one, so let's say like zero, if I plug in my lower bound, zero, what do I end up with? One minus zero is one, which is positive. So if I plug in a value less than or equal to one, I'm gonna end up with a positive value. So that means my function will be unchanged. The absolute value won't do anything if the number inside of it is positive. But if X is greater than one, okay, then, my value inside of my absolute value is negative, which means the absolute value is gonna change the sign of it. To change the sign, you just put another negative in front of it, because that negative will cancel out the negative that I'm gonna get out in one minus x squared. So the rule is different based off of my choice of x, but the important part is that we figured out where the rule changes. Why is that important? Because based off of my number one property, I can rewrite this integral like so. I can split it up into two separate integrals, one from zero to one. The reason why I'm doing this is so I can get rid of the absolute value. Right, from zero to one, my output's gonna be positive and so, the function is unchanged. 
but then from one to three, my output is negative, which means I have to compensate by multiplying it by another negative. And so what I was successfully able to do was get rid of the absolute value. And I can now evaluate this function. Okay. So integral, uh, the antiderivative of one minus x squared is x minus x cubed over three. This integral is being evaluated from zero to one. I'm, I'm gonna go ahead and move this negative symbol outside because it just represents a constant. So I get minus, and then I have the same exact antiderivative, x minus x cubed over three, being evaluated from one to three. Okay, um, when I plug in zero, I get zero. When I plug in one, I get one minus one third. Okay, that's my first integral, minus, and then here's my second integral. If I plug in three, I get three minus three cubed over three. Um, ooh. What is three cubed minus three? Three cubed is 27 divided by three, so that's three minus nine, minus. And then when I plug in one, of course, I get one minus one third. So what does this leave me with? This leaves me with two thirds over here. Minus three minus nine is negative six. And then I'm minusing, let me just, just so you guys can keep track. I'm minusing uh, negative two thirds, which means I'm adding two thirds. Okay. What does that give me? That gives me six, because these two negatives will also cancel out. And so I'm left with six plus four thirds, um, or seven and one third. Okay. So the other area where this might be useful is, let's say you have so you might see a problem like this on the homework. So, the, so here's another example where this property might be useful. Let's say you have a function like this. Okay, uh, uh, We don't do trig in this class, but if you did, you'd rec you might recognize this as a sine function. This is my sine function. But what's important about this is if you were to find, let's go ahead and call this zero to b, if you were to find the integral from 0 to b of this function, anyone would want to take a guess of what this would end up equaling? Since this area and this area are equal, but one's counted positive and one's counted negative, you're going to end up with 0. Right? The total area is zero because you have an equal amount of positive area as you do negative area. But what if that's not what I was interested in? What if I actually wanted to know how much total area I have if both are counted positive? Well, to figure that out, all I would have to do is figure out what this value is and now break it up into two separate integrals. Find the integral from zero to a of f of x plus the integral from a to b of f of x. But if I just leave it like this, once again, this is going to count the area as negative, and I don't want it to be counted as, as negative. So what am I going to do? Similar to what I just barely did with my absolute value, I'm just going to stick a negative in front of it. And that'll make sure that the area is actually counted as positive. So you might see a question or two like that on your homework. The second property we're going to talk about this section is finding area between two curves. So a good example of this is, take a look at this graph I have. If I have two cars that are, like, let's say this is a drag race, right? Ready, set, go, and they just start accelerating. Uh, we have car A in blue and car B in green. Uh, intuitively, we can see that car A is accelerating faster, right? Because its velocity is consistently higher than cars B. 
So if I were to ask you, what does the area underneath the curve from 0 to 5 represent? Could you tell me? It turns out in this example that the area between the curves represents how much farther did car A go than car B over these first five seconds? How much farther did car A go? So, how would I calculate that? Well, this is my second property. So, given, I'll underline this because that's kind of the, the big idea of this property. Given an interval A to B and some functions f of x greater than or equal to g of x. So we're going to go ahead and assume that f is the bigger function. Okay. And we're going to assume that f of x is bigger than g over my interval. So over a to b. Then I can take the definite integral from a to b of f of x minus g of x. And that will give me the area of the region. Um, I'm going to use kind of fancier talk here, but it really is just the area between the curves. But the area of the region um, enclosed by the two curves. Okay. So, um, let's look at an example of this one. So, uh, find the area enclosed by the following two functions. Okay. Let's say f of x is equal to 2x plus 1, and g of x is equal to x squared plus 1. Okay, and that's all I'm going to give you. So you'll notice, what did I not give you? I didn't give you any bounds. There's no bounds here. So where am I supposed to start? Where am I supposed to finish? Okay, well, it might help if you draw a graph, um, because these are two fundamentally different types of functions. g of x is going to be a parabola, an upward-facing parabola. f of x is what type of function? f of x is linear. So, if you think about it, how many times would we expect... Well, now let's keep drawing a graph. So, if I were to actually draw these on a graph, x squared plus 1 is going to look like this. 2x plus 1, well, 2x plus 1 has a y-intercept of 1 and then a slope of 2. So it's going to go like this. So where do we see an area enclosed by the, the, by the two functions? We see an area right here. Interesting. So what are my bounds? My bounds end up being the two points... The two points, here actually I'll do them in yellow just to highlight it anymore. The two points where the functions intersect. How do I find that? The bounds are the two points where the functions intersect. How do I find that? I can set my equations equal to each other. I can just say, well, let's see where these two functions end up equaling the same value. And then solve for x. Okay. Well, because I have an x squared term and an x term, uh, what's going to happen is I'm going to end up with a, with a quadratic function. I'm going to subtract. Um, actually, I'll keep the positive x squared. I'll subtract the 2x and the 1 onto I'll get everything onto one side so that the one side is equal to 0. And I'm left with x squared minus 2x. Well, if I subtract 1, both of the plus 1s cancel out, and I'm just left with x squared minus 2x. That makes it easy to factor, 
right? I can factor out an x, and I get x minus 2. And that tells me that my two solutions are x equals 0 and x equals 2. And there's my bounds, right? That matches my picture right over here. It turns out that this x value is 2. So I have my bounds of my function. I know I'm going from 0 to 2 with this definite integral. But I still need to know which function is bigger over this interval. Which function is bigger? We might naturally think that, oh, the linear function is going to be smaller than the quadratic. And that's true for most values. That's true for any large x values. But because we're looking between 0 and 2, all my numbers are going to be relatively small. And it turns out that I can actually see this in the graph, which is my bigger function the linear function is. So I'm going to put my linear function first. There's my f of x. And to find the area between the curves, I'm going to subtract the lower function. Okay. If I simplify that, I get the ones cancel out again, and I'm just left with 2x minus x squared. That's a simple enough function to find the definite integral for. So I'll take the antiderivative. I get 2x squared over 2 minus x cubed over 3, evaluated from 0 to 2. Of course, 2x over 2, those 2s just cancel. I'm going to plug in my bounds. So I get 4, 2 cubed is 8. So 4 minus 8 cubed minus what happens when I plug in 0? I just end up with 0. Right, 0 squared minus 0 cubed over 3, and you just end up with 0. So, very nice. I get 4 minus 8 thirds, that just ends up being 4 thirds. Okay, what if... So that's how, so that's how we can find the area between two curves. But what if you struggle knowing which one's the higher, the bigger function, and which one's the lower function, okay? Well, take a look at what happens if I mix these up. What if I say, mm, no, 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 you're crazy, Mr. Johnson. Um, the x squared plus 1 is quadratic. It needs to be my bigger function. The linear function has got to be smaller, so it's going to go second. Well, take a look at what happens. Uh, I'll go ahead and simplify this. The 1s still cancel, and I'm left with x squared minus 2x dx. I'll take the antiderivative here. And I get x cubed over 3 minus x squared. Uh, once again, because I get 2x squared over 2 and the 2s cancel. And I'm evaluating that from 0 to 2. Well, if I do that, I end up with something very similar that I did uh, as I did the last time. I get 8 thirds minus 4. Very similar, just the opposite way around. And so I end up with negative 4 thirds. If you end up with a negative area with, with a problem like this, right? If you're finding area between the curves, but you end up with a negative area, all that means is you mixed up which one's the bigger function, which one's the smaller function. Okay? You don't need to go back through and do all the work again. This is still your correct answer. All I'm going to do is just make it positive. Okay? Because area between two curves should always be positive. Area between two curves should always be positive. The third and last property of definite integrals that we're going to talk about has to do with the average value. Now, you might be thinking, what, what does this have to do with integrals? I know how to find average value, right? We're used to this formula to find average of, right, the sum of data points. You add them all up and divide by the number. Right, Num divided by the number of data points. Right, that's how we've found averages since you know, sixth grade. Add, add them all up, divide by how many there are. But, but let me ask you a question. What if you have an infinite number of data points? How are you supposed to do that then? Right? Well, having an infinite number of data points is equivalent to just having a function. What if you have a function? If you have a function, then theoretically you have an infinite number of data points because you can plug in whatever x values you want. 
So what if you have a function? What's the average value of that function? Well, this is where we can actually use integrals. And so let me see if I can explain this with a picture. Okay. Let's say we have some function and we want the average value of that function from A to B. Okay. Well, imagine with me, let's imagine that this area, this two-dimensional area here is modeled using, I don't know, Play-Doh, okay? We find a very specific amount of Play-Doh that will make this shape from A to B. But now what we're going to do is we're going to, we're going to recreate, we're going to mess with this shape and shove it into the shape of a rectangle. Okay, what's going to happen when I do that? When I shove it into the shape of a rectangle, it's not going to make a rectangle up here, right? And it's not going to make a rectangle up down here, of course, because the, the, the rectangle will have the same amount of area as what I started with. I'm just reshaping that area into a rectangle, so it'll end up somewhere around here. This is, of course, just an approximation. Okay. Guess what this y value ends up being? This y value ends up being my average value of my function. And you'll notice that as I went through describing this, I used the word area, right? I'm reshaping the area under this curve into a rectangle. So because this deals with area under the curve, I can use a definite integral, okay? So to find average value, so average value of your function y, I'm going to find the definite integral of my function from a to b. Uh, sorry, this is the average value of function over, oopsies, over an, inter, uh, over an interval A to B. I didn't specifically mention that. Okay. So I'm going to take the definite integral of my function from A to B. But if I do that, it's going to give me an area. And I don't want an area. I want to know specifically what's this Y value. What is that Y value? Well, if I want to find the Y value, remember area is your Y value times your difference in your x values, right? Your y value times this distance between your lower bound and your upper bound. So to get just the y value, I can, right, since area is length times width, or in our case, it's probably better for us to use base times height. But I only want the height, I can just do area divided by the base. In our case, the base is this difference between my bounds. So when I'm done taking the definite integral, I'm going to divide it by that change in x, that difference between my bounds. And that's my average value formula. Okay, You just take the definite integral of the function from a to b and then divide it by the distance, the difference between your bounds. So let's take a look at an example of this. Okay, let's look at the population of the U.S. since 2010. Okay, since we have enough data here, um, we can model it using this function, population over time equals 310.65e to the 0.00722t. And of course, population is in millions. Right? Population in the US wasn't only 310 people in 2010, it was 310 million people. So this is in millions. Okay? So let's say I wanted to find, find the average population.
from mm, 2012 to 2019. Okay. Now, once again, because we have an actual function to model this, that means I have an infinite number of data points. So I don't just want to add the populations in 2010, 2011, or sorry, 2012, 2013, 2014, because that's missing so much data. This is where an integral would be helpful. I'm going to use my average value formula for a function. Okay, so what is this average population going to look like? Average population... It's going to equal, well, if I start with this 1 over b minus a, what's b minus a? What are my bounds? Since I'm looking from 2012 to 2019, that represents my upper bound is 9, because it's been 9 years since 2010, and my lower bound is 2, since it's been 2 years from 2010. So this gives me 1 over 9 minus 2, times the integral from 2 to 9 of 310.65e to the 0 0.007222t. So that's how I would set it up. Okay. So if I kept going, 1 over 7... That's, you know, 1 over 9 minus 2. That's, 9 minus 2 is just 7. Uh, remind me. This is a good little reminder of exponentials. This is the first exponential one we've done in a while. How do I find the antiderivative of this? I keep everything, everything the same, except I'm just going to divide by this constant. So I get um, 310.65 divided by 0 0.00722. E to the point zero, oh, sorry, point two zeros, point zero zero seven two two t, and that's evaluated from two to nine, and this is going to require some significant calculator work, okay, um, so I won't actually finish this. I'll let you guys finish it if you'd like, but, um, and then if, and remember this just means I still need to evaluate it from two to nine. I'll plug in nine, see what I get. Plug in 2, see what I get, and subtract the 2. And that will give you your average population. Okay, let me know if you have any questions on your homework as you work through it, and I'll see you in the next video.